My whole life, I, I've been an athlete. I've been a husband. I, I've been an attorney. People have always relied upon me to provide for them. On May 6, 2009, I was playing softball on a field just like the one behind me. Sat down in the dugout in between innings. Had no warning signs, no complaints. I didn't feel sick or anything like that. Next thing you know, I woke up in an ambulance, somebody telling me how lucky I was. What happened, I learned, is that I was sitting in the dugout and I just passed over. I was clinically dead for three to five minutes. I was told I had no pulse, I was turning blue. Fortunately, two mothers kept me sustainable by doing CPR on me, and I woke up in the ambulance, and I didn't know what happened, and the ambulance driver said to me, you're a very lucky guy, and I, I really couldn't figure out why I was so lucky. Not everybody is so lucky. Every minute of every day, somebody dies of a heart attack in America. It's the nation's biggest killer. More frightening than that is that a huge number of the people who die drop dead without any warning they've got heart disease. About a third of patients, the first event is, a, uh, is sudden death. And the reason is the disease is silent. When I got to the hospital, they told me there were two major blockages you know, in my left anterior descending artery. It's called the Widowmaker. It's a 99 and a 95% blockage. And they said it was an absolute miracle that I was still there. Two thirds of men and half of all women, the first sign or symptom is that they have a heart attack or die. You don't know you have it until, until you're dead. And it doesn't have to be that way. Heart attacks and strokes are absolutely preventable. The science is the slam dunk. Every time I read the newspaper and I see, you know, a 45-year-old or a 55-year-old or a 62-year-old person just drop dead of a heart attack unsuspectingly, you know, it's a little disheartening because I know that that life would have easily been saved. A major heart attack lasts only minutes. One moment the heart is beating normally, all four chambers moving in that familiar rhythm. Suddenly, a coronary artery blocks. The flow of blood to the heart stops. The heart starts to beat wildly. There are now only moments left to save the victim's life. 29, And if that attempt fails, starved of oxygen, the heart dies. And so does the victim. Eight, come on. 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, start again. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9,
Okay, start again. This year alone, 600,000 Americans will die like this, more than from all the cancers combined. A quarter of these deaths without any prior symptoms or warning. We had spent the uh, 4th of July at our home here um, in East Elmhurst, and we had a nice family barbecue, and we were hanging out, and you wouldn't think that anything was just any normal day. The next morning, my husband, we have a home in uh, Fort Lauderdale, went to our summer home, and he called me when he arrived. And he said, I arrived, everything's OK, and I carried along my merry way to work. I, I was in a meeting, and my phone kept ringing, but I ignored it. I continued along in the meeting, because you cannot answer a phone in a meeting. But then my son's number, his cell phone number, showed up on my phone. So I answered that call. <laughs> And my son told me that he received the call and that something had happened to dad. At that point, my phone rang again, and it was the police calling. And they told me that they rushed my husband to the hospital. Next thing I know, calls were made, and I was on board an aircraft so I can get there. And um, that plane just never took off, because just as they were about to close the doors, they got another phone call. Uh, the person on the other end said to me, um, are you alone? And I said, no, I'm on a plane full of people. I'm not alone. And they said, you know, we're calling about your husband. I said, I know. Tell him I'm on my way. I I'm coming. And they said, no, no one told you. He's, he's gone. It was something I couldn't believe because there were no symptoms. We just spoke. And within a couple hours, my whole life changed. <laughs> Alpha was s slim, six foot three. Yeah, occasional, you know, social smoker, but he wasn't like packs a day, and he was just healthy. I, I felt like I was still walking in a in a. It was a nightmare. <laughs> I mean, I, I I thought this can't be happening. Is this really real? That particular day, the Fourth of July, was just the best time of our life. I mean, we just had a great time. I mean, and the next day that it was just a memory. In the last 30 years, more than 4 million American citizens have shared Alpha's fate, dying suddenly without any warning. But the vast majority of them, men and women, could have been saved. Here's how. The trail starts here in San Francisco. Down the decades, the city by the bay has been home to a series of world famous events. A gold rush, an earthquake, a computer revolution, and wholly new ways of seeing the world. But the city might have a more fundamental legacy a way of stopping all those needless deaths. In the 60s and 70s, heart doctors or cardiologists are grappling with not one, but two problems. Life is full of stress, Elliot. especially for busy executives. Are you kidding? The whole shipment, you're sending it back? People are dying suddenly of a heart attack before they can get to the hospital. But they're also dying if they do make it to the operating table because heart surgery is largely ineffective. So surgeons naturally want to make surgery work. And one man thinks he knows how. The first heart revolution starts not in a lab, but a garage 40 miles north of the city center. How long is it since you've been here? 33 years. 33 years. And this tree, obviously, I don't remember. 
And this is also much larger, everything. Yeah, and that's my garage. Come on. <laughs> In 1980, Julio Palmas is a junior radiologist, fresh off the plane from Argentina. Well, I have my cars here, and my, my uh, workbench was right here. Yeah. I had a uh, Triumph Spitfire, my baby, uh, parked right here. It was so small, so I, I had place for my bench. After dinner, I would come and start playing with wires, pliers, rubber tubes, and all those things. Julio is fascinated by arterial blood flow and its relation to heart disease. He was the number one killer when I was in medical school, and it still is today the number one killer. The key is plaque, a sticky, gooey substance largely made up of cholesterol. It builds up in the walls of the coronary arteries until one day it ruptures causes a blood clot, which blocks the vein, and stops the flow of blood to the heart, triggering an attack. Cardiologists are trying to thread balloons down arteries, blow them up, and crush the clot. But once the balloons are gone, the arteries close up again, what doctors call re-stenosis, and the patients die. Julio has a simple idea. Stick a piece of metal on the balloon, a sort of scaffold to keep the vein open when the balloon is pulled out. It's called a stent. But the first results of Julio's invention are disastrous. The atmosphere was uh, marginally chaotic. We didn't have the right equipment. Uh, the devices were um, uh, prototypes at best. They were hand crimped on balloons. Um, they were um, uh, difficult to deliver to coronary arteries. They were associated with a high frequency of blood clots or thrombosis in the early stages, uh, and the outcomes were not nearly as good as we had expected. There was a lot of uncertainty within the medical community that this was the right thing to do. We were heavily criticized for being cowboys, for being uh, less critical thinkers, for being non-scientific. So there was uh, a, uh, an overwhelming negative outcry within the general medical and cardiologic communities. While the stent is in trouble, there's a very high profile reminder of what's at stake. Well, uh, that night on the 23rd, I uh, was doing my CNN show, interviewed Dr. C. Everett Koop, the Surgeon General of the United States. At the end of the interview, he asked me if I was still smoking. I said yes, and he said, you know, uh, you don't look good. I said, I feel fine. He said, I don't like the way you look. You ought to see a doctor. So I said, OK. And then I went to do my all-night radio show. And uh, my guest was David Halberstam, the late David Halberstam, terrific writer. And at the end of that interview, he said, are you, are you feeling OK? I said, why? Well, he said, you, you, you don't look good. Apparently, I had a gray pallor. So I went back home, and I got off the air. It was about 4 in the morning. And I had this terrible pain in my right shoulder. I'd never experienced that kind of pain before. I didn't have chest pain, and it was going down my arm. And I didn't know what to do. I called my doctor and woke him up. And he said, well, right side sounds like a gallbladder. Why don't you go to the hospital in the morning? So first thing in the morning, my producer picked me up and drove me over to George Washington University Hospital. So I walked into the emergency room. This man came up to me. And they have viewers in the emergency room who look at people to see how. And he said, uh, are you a heart patient? And I said, no. And he said, well, you don't look good. And that's the third time I've heard you don't look good. And they came over and took some blood tests. And then they went over to a screen, and they were looking at the screen, and this blood test came up on the screen. And suddenly, they turned around, and the doctor and the nurses, blue light went off. And they came running toward me. And I said to uh, my producer, I don't think this is a pulled muscle. The doctor came right over and he said, Mr. King, you're having a heart attack. And I said, uh, am I going to die? And he said, good question. And he said, uh, we don't have the answer. But it's the right side, and that's a good sign, because right sides generally do better than the left side. I wound up with a quintuple bypass. That was much scarier than a heart attack. When the doctor explained to me we're going to uh, cut open your chest. <laughs> That's nice. 
And uh, we're going to pull you apart and put you on a heart-lung machine and move the heart a little and do a bypass, which is similar to a highway with a blocked exit, and then we're going to go around the exit. We'll take veins from your leg, and the veins will circulate around, and uh, we hope you do well. I changed my life that day. I never felt better after that. I recovered pretty quickly. I uh, came home from the hospital, vowed to get healthy, lost a lot of weight, uh, changed my diet, never smoked again. You know, my wife believes in the afterlife. I don't, I don't want to ride the bet. Back in the Bay Area, at exactly the same time Julio is dreaming up his stent, other doctors come up with a way of winning Larry's bet. Right in the heart of Haight-Ashbury, the epicenter of flower power, stands the University of San Francisco, or UCSF. The team here don't want to wait until somebody has a heart attack and rely on expensive and risky surgery to save them. They want to prevent the attack happening at all. Why wouldn't it make sense if we set up, like, we do uh, mammograms for screening for breast cancer, why don't we do mammograms of the heart? There's a problem with a mammogram of the heart. It beats too fast for a conventional x-ray to take a picture. So Bruce travels three floors down to an eccentric but talented physicist who has thought up a way of improving the existing technology. The essence was, uh, rather than rotating mechanically an x-ray tube around the body, and that's how CT technology works, to use a scanning electron beam to produce a moving source of x-rays. These are the constituent parts of Doug Boyd's revolutionary machine, still stored in a small office in the bay. People were skeptical. Most people couldn't even understand the concept. The Terpagosians of the world were telling you that couldn't be done. Couldn't, couldn't be, be done. done. And one day he said to me, Bruce, would you like to see something really neat? And you invited me down to uh, see you turn on the electron beam down there. Oh, down in the basement in the of the clinic, hospital? Right, yeah. where it was dirt on the floor. It wasn't even concrete floor. Yeah, yeah. yeah. When we yeah. got the first beam, that was a, a big moment, at least for physicists. Well, you know, it was considered pretty far out at the time. No one had ever been able to produce an electron beam with that much power. Incredibly, down in the dirt of UCSF's basement, Doug's ray gun works. But you just put your head there and your feet down yep. here, and that slides the patient into the scanner. And then an image that nobody has ever seen before. So these are the coronary arteries here. In the beginning, um, I think everybody was extremely interested. And everybody would say, well, what's that white stuff that's that I see there. And I said, well, that's calcium in the coronary arteries. Calcium, a crucial ingredient in our bones and just what you don't want in your heart. The calcium is actually part of the healing process. When we develop deposits of uh, cholesterol in the wall of the artery, one of the body's natural defense mechanisms is to put down calcium to try to heal this sort of bubble. So in and of itself, it doesn't cause the disease. What it does, though, is it doesn't occur there unless there is plaque there. Before the advent of Doug's ray gun, doctors had to use a complicated formula dreamt up at Harvard in the 50s to work out somebody's risk of heart attack. Adding together weight, age, lifestyle, cholesterol, and then guess. You could have all the risk factors and not have any coronary disease. You could have none of the risk factors and have coronary disease. But if you have a coronary scan and you see calcium, you know you have disease. It's not a risk factor. It is looking at the disease, part of the disease process. A group of pioneering doctors leap on it and even call themselves the Calcium Club. It's like the Breakfast, breakfast Club, you know, the movie about the, the teenagers in high school. Well, this was a Calcium Club. Was it as much fun? Um, no. <laughs> it was not as much fun. But it was much more productive, ultimately. Breathe in. Hold your breath. The scores go uh, zero. It can go as high as four or 5,000. 
So I call it mild, uh, zero, mild, moderate, extensive, and oh my God. Breathe in, hold your breath. Uh, zero is the best I can do for you. Uh, one to 100 is called mild. Uh, uh, 101 to 399 or 400 is considered uh, moderate. Uh, 400 to 1,000 is considered extensive. And above 1,000 is in the oh my God category. Here's the beginning of the left main coronary artery, very normal. As we go to the next slice though, we see plaque right here. Every time we tried to redo the experiments, we got the same answers. It was just remarkable. The more plaque you had, the more your risk was going to be. It was independent of your cholesterol, independent of your smoking history. It was the most powerful predictor of risk. Look, what are your alternatives? You say to a person, well, you're at low risk, and then if the patient dies, oh, I was wrong, sorry. Why guess? Why base your decision on a score derived from a compilation of risk factors when you can look directly at the heart and see how much plaque there is there? It looks like the coronary artery scan is about to transform the hearts and lives of the nation. The new technique can pick out the patients that conventional risk analysis cannot. Thin, fit, and outwardly healthy, and that's a lot of people. In the four years after coronary artery scanning is invented, over half a million people die of a heart attack with absolutely no warning. California has a governor going places, Pete Wilson. Some talk of him as a potential president. His key aide is Otto Boss, an energetic press liaison in his mid-40s. He was somebody important. I do remember that. Everybody knew him, and he was the guy behind the guy. So if you wanted to talk to Pete, everybody knew basically you had to go through Otto. So, it was pretty cool. So everybody knew me as Otto's kid, and of course I was his firstborn, so everybody treated me like, like a rock star. So it's, everybody's kind of like, oh, that's Otto's kid. Be nice to him. June 2nd was, oh gosh, it's like, it's like yesterday. Uh, we were actually playing baseball out here on the front street, and then my mother was inside here with our neighbor, and I was called in by our neighbor to, hey, can you please come in and talk to your mom? And I was, 15 year old kid so i'm like yeah yeah lady i'll i'll come in when i want to come in and then she came back out and she was like no seriously you need to come talk to your mother now she was sitting on the corner of the bed and she basically just said that my dad had a heart attack and he was at the hospital i was thinking okay he had a heart attack he'll be fine and because basically in my eyes my dad was like superman and um you know nothing ever could really you know do anything to him we went to that hospital and then when we got there um a doctor pulled my mo mother aside, and, and then my mom came out, and she was very, very tearful. I knew something was really bad, because I kept going, when are we going to see my dad? And then, uh, long story short, the doctor sat down in front of me about where you are and just told me that my father had passed, and this is what had happened. And, 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 I, and I was a little confused, one, why he was telling me, and not my mother. But they say his arteries were clogged. He looked young. He would never guess that he was 47. Rock and tan, you know, because he was always playing soccer. Um, there was no indication that he was going to have the type of heart failure that he had. It definitely, it definitely messes with you a lot. So I'm 15 years old. I turned 16. I'm basically an adult. Um, I'm no longer the kid that goes out with his friends and goes and parties and drinks and does. Uh, I don't do any of that stuff. And I mean, I had to be a role model for my younger brother and sister and not get myself in trouble and try to be dad for them and you know coach little league which i did and take my sister to ballet and my brother to basketball and, and and do all the stuff that a dad would do and so that was basically my life for oh gosh until my mid-20s my advice to any person that's you know here on the plan just enjoy it for what it is enjoy the ride because you just never know As the unexpected deaths pile up, the way forward seems clear in the battle of the stent and the scan. The scan helps prevent heart attacks and costs only a few hundred bucks. 
The stent is risky, expensive at tens of thousands of dollars, and the patient has to either have or be on the brink of having a heart attack. But that analysis neglects the profit motive, which first attracted Julio Palmaz's backer, burger billionaire Phil Romano. He came in and he had the ponytail and he had uh, his three-piece suit and nice tie and uh, well-groomed person and uh, had no socks. I mean, he, he was a very fashionable guy. Certainly not a person that knew anything really about the business of implantable devices. But intuitively, he saw potential. At the end of a meeting, uh, he said, put the thing in his hand and he was rolling it around and he said, this looks like something I, put it, I can put in a box and sell for lots of money. And uh, to the dismay of his lawyer, he went ahead and said, uh, how much money you need? Nineteen ninety four and money talks. Now we're in New York, home to the world's financial center and some of its most renowned hospitals who share Wall Street's money making smarts. These hospitals can make or break a technique or pill. So stent or scan, which is it going to be? With Phil Romano's money behind it, the stent is suddenly a reliable proposition. And in record time, it gets an official license. Uh, the devices became much more deliverable. And um, from a technical standpoint, there were dramatic improvements. But by the late 90s, the um, the paradigm for treating patients with coronary disease was literally just stented. One of the first places to stent it is Mount Sinai, halfway up Manhattan's Tony Upper East Side. Samin Sharma, their star surgeon, changes his modus operandi overnight. I did about uh, 1,000 cases first time in 1999. Now, since then, or let's say last 10 years, it has been about 15 to 1,600 uh, interventions per year. I work uh, three and a half days a week, uh, Monday, Tuesday, and Fridays. Like today, today is a Friday, is a typical day. I'm to my 21st case, and I've done the 12 intervention, but I have nine more to go. All right, my friend, we'll be done in just a few seconds now. What Samin Sharma is doing again and again is threading catheters or thin tubes up arteries to first take a picture of any blockage. That's an angiogram. And then gently maneuver a stent in place at the point of blockage or stenosis. Open it up and restore the blood flow. Right there. This was the 95% blockage. And now, after the stent, normal looking artery. All right, my friend, we are done now. Thank you. Crucially, this operation has a financial as well as a medical attraction for hospitals. At up to 50,000 bucks a go, the profits associated with it are huge. These cramped cath labs actually saved Mount Sinai from bankruptcy in the late 90s. And as the money floods into stents, so the doctors who practice the technique become very rich. Dr. Sharma earns over $3 million a year. I think part of the success is also that you do the same thing all the time, repeatedly. You'll get bored. If I get bored, I do a few more stents. <laughs> if he is getting rich, the stents inventor is getting even richer. Uh, things went well for us. Uh, my wife said, why not get a little place uh, in Napa Valley and make some wine? It got a little bit out of hand. And uh, so she did find a, a bigger place that we anticipated. And uh, we make about somewhere between five and 6,000 cases a year. The success of the stent propels the man who first tests it, Marty Leon, into cardiac stardom. He becomes one of the richest doctors in the US earning millions in his hospital work and millions more as a key advisor to big companies. He even starts his own foundation. 
you know, it's hard to say what is in whack and out of whack. Uh, is an orthopedic surgeon out of whack? Is a neurosurgeon out of whack? Is a cardiac surgeon out of whack? Is an interventionalist out of whack? I, I, it, it, I mean, these become philosophical discussions about, um, um, you know, how medicine is practiced. In a FIFA service environment, I think there's certainly going to be high-end physicians who make a great deal of money, and, and, and that's fine. But for all the stents' apparent success, financial and medical, it still does nothing for those people who die before they can get to a hospital. By the mid-90s, the cumulative total of asymptomatic deaths has risen to a staggering two million. What is the address of the emergency? I need an ambulance quick. What's the address? We were just sitting talking, my wife fell on the floor. Okay, what's... Quick, I don't think she's breathing. Okay, I'm sending paramedics to help you now. Stay on the line, I'll tell you exactly what to do next, okay? Yeah. I want you to no. place place your hand on her forehead, your other hand under her neck, and tilt her head back. Yeah. Put your ear next to her mouth and tell me if you can feel or hear any breathing. Okay, hang on. Okay. No, I can't. Oh, God, oh, my Hurry. Okay, they're on their way. Oh, You're doing oh. fine. For these people, the scan offers the only hope. But the medical establishment shun it. The nation's top doctors pour scorn on the claims the Calcium Club make for their new technique. Most vociferously, the one man they expect to support it, Steve Nissen, the most prominent preventionist in the US, based at the world-famous Cleveland Clinic. Well, I'm not a fan of it. To date, no one's been able to show that knowing how much calcium is in the arteries actually allows you to change the outcome for patients. So it tells you who's at risk, but it doesn't tell you what to do for them. I would say that there are some people who still believe the world is flat, but clearly it's not. We know that it identifies high-risk patients. We know that treating high-risk patients saves lives. Therefore, identification of the high-risk patient will save lives. Look, I don't like medical cults. And we these things happen all the time. You know, these cults develop. And when they're not based upon what I consider to be the most solid science, then it does bother me. The kind of outcome data that they're asking for has not been provided for any other technology. For instance, there's never been a study that shows that the use of a stress test saves lives, or the use of an echocardiogram saves lives. I called it the deadly double standard, which means applying criteria to coronary calcium that have simply not been applied to any other preceding technology. But this was an argument that was as much about money as medicine. Cardiologists thought the scanner was an expensive waste of time while the Calcium Club argued they could save hospitals money by predicting who really needed surgery. During the uh, late 1990s, the Mayo Clinic was reporting about 50% of its coronary angiograms were normal. That's equivalent to saying unnecessary. The Mayo Clinic was, is still a major research center with excellent researchers, the best in the world. And Mayo Clinic had done some research studies showing that coronary calcium could predict who needs a coronary angiogram and who doesn't. So the researchers said, well, we have this test with almost 100% accuracy for predicting who should have an angiogram and who shouldn't. Why don't we offer this to our patients? And uh, the administration shut it down because the cath lab generates 25% of the revenue of the Mayo Clinic, and uh, that would have been cut in half if they started not doing unnecessary angiograms. The authorities won't endorse it, so insurers won't pay for it. Very few doctors will use it. But all the while, people are dying without any warning. By the late 90s, over two and a half million unexpected, unanticipated deaths. Steve was a, uh, a warm, the warmest guy, friendly, caring, 
uh, easygoing, good-natured. You know, he would just have, he has the, the patience and the heart of gold to listen to people and care about them. And he, had, he was full of empathy. When we met, I was 20, he was 23. He had his own clothing store, active clothing wear store. And I had to come in to get my matching headband for my aerobics outfit. <laughs> and he did not have the color I needed, so I came back and we hit it off. Four days prior, we had just gotten back from Cancun, Mexico. We were there for a week. We just, we had a relaxing time, you know, just a fun getaway. Just he and I, no kids. Our daughters were two and five, so it was nice to get away from the kids. He came home from work about six o'clock that night, rushing to get out. It was his first league basketball game of the year. So he put on his jersey and uh, rushing. He gave me a kiss goodbye. And um, that was at about 6.30 at night. At 10 o'clock that night is when I got the phone call from the manager at the gym that said, uh, your husband's had an accident. So I said, oh, what happened now? Thinking he just, you know, he broke his ankle or sprained something. And he said, well, his heart stopped and they, they can't start it. You know, it's surreal driving to a hospital, not knowing if your spouse is going to be alive or not, or in a vegetative state or not. And, you know, you make, like, you're making deals with, you know, with God. Like, I said, I, I want him to be alive, but I want him to be healthy. I, you know, I don't, I don't want him to be a vegetable. That wouldn't be any kind of quality of life for either of us. Sure enough, I got to the hospital, ran in, and the uh, emergency room doctor told me that they could not resuscitate him. And he was dead. Steve ate well. He did not smoke, and he worked out. So, who knows? He was actually carrying around four clogged arteries. Eight, seven, six. Like Steve Cohen, NASA's astronauts are outwardly extremely fit and health conscious. For just when it looked like coronary artery scanning was dead, salvation in the most unlikely place, space. We've long known that cardiovascular disease is the greatest risk that we face. Especially given our population, most astronauts are middle-aged males. The consequences for us are dire. We're talking about people dying in space. The agency had had a real scare in 1971 with Apollo 15. Oh boy, it's beautiful out here. At the time, NASA hailed it as the most successful mission so far. Looks like pristine material, all right. On the surface of the moon, Commander David Scott and lunar module pilot Jim Irwin did three moonwalks collected a vast array of moon rocks, and drove a lunar rover for the first time. Man, this is really a rock and roll ride, isn't it? But out of sight of the cameras, once Irwin was back in the command module, instruments appear to show all the symptoms of a serious cardiac event. After anguished debate, Mission Control realized that breathing the oxygen of Endeavour's cabin and living in zero gravity Erwin might as well be in a hospital intensive care unit. Then, on August 7th, they looked into the fireball created by the heat of their re-entry into the Earth's atmosphere at 25,000 miles per hour. The mission made it back safely. But a few months after he landed, Jim Irwin had a massive heart attack. We became aware of coronary calcium scoring probably in the early 2000s. There are a number of us who were interested in improving our risk predictions. We had a couple of individuals who are involved in our various flight operations have acute coronary syndrome events prior to a mission. 
you know, in both those cases, we got lucky. From 2006 on, all potential astronauts have to have a zero score or they don't get in. But it isn't only astronauts who are at risk. We're here outside New York Presbyterian Hospital in just a couple of hours. President Bill Clinton, former president, is uh, scheduled to undergo surgery to bypass disease vessels in his heart. In 2004, former President Clinton checks himself into hospital with chest pain, only to discover he has chronic heart disease and needs an immediate quintuple bypass. But many people are asking, how could a former president who gets regular checkups end up so suddenly with heart disease? Clinton bragged last night that he had aced his stress tests for four or five years in a row. I just uh, had the pleasure of meeting President, past President Clinton uh, last Thursday, and um, he told this story about how he went through five treadmills while in office. He was cleared five times, told he was doing great. They stopped his cholesterol medication. He actually told me he had a calcium scan. That was abnormal, but his doctors didn't really do anything with it, and ultimately he needed five-way bypass. He did very well initially on the South Beach diet, went back to his high school rate, did a lot of exercise, was on a statin, and he stopped the statin, is my understanding, because he lost weight. But he clearly, for the amount of calcium he had at a fairly young age, there was a genetic component. And genetic uh, components, you have to go beyond often lifestyle and treat with, with medication. Such is the shock of Clinton's operation. The White House decides that all future presidents will have a coronary artery calcium scan. The stakes are simply too high not to. So is scanning on the comeback trail? Maybe. At exactly the moment Clinton's life is hanging in the balance, so too is the fate of coronary artery scanning. The setting is Boston, home to the world's most famous university. In fall 2004, scanning is on the verge of qualified national approval, right here. A committee of the American Heart Association has passed it, and their findings are about to be published as a statement in circulation. The House Journal of Cardiologists Worldwide. I like to think that uh, circulation and all uh, high-quality journals provide, uh, if you will, a path to enlightenment. If you consider, uh, if you consider the, uh, our workplace, we sit in a, in a sort of forest of knowledge and we want to achieve enlightenment. So the question is, how do we traverse the forest? And um, I would suggest that what a well-edited journal does is that it, 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 it provides some guidance to the right path. But unfortunately, one member of the Calcium Club can't contain his excitement that his technique is about to win through. We had a statement coming out. It was approved by the American Heart Association, a scientific statement saying that calcium scoring was useful and, and uh, appropriate and had adequate scientific uh, data behind it. Well, I, I'd just become editor of Circulation. I uh, was uh, surprised and, and, and troubled to find as I was flying to Europe for a meeting, uh, reading the Wall Street Journal, that uh, I was quoted as the editor um, as uh, having uh, pointed out that the American Heart Association was about to support the use of coronary calcium. The American Heart Association, and certainly the journal Circulation, never advocates the use of a particular strategy for diagnosis or for therapy. We try to report information as we find it as objectively as possible. But when I returned home, I also found a, an envelope addressed to me in which it was pointed out that the American Heart Association was about to support the use of coronary calcium screening and that as a cardiologist, I might wish to uh, purchase a device. Given those events, uh, I decided to withhold publication. The previous document, which was very negative, the first author of that, Dr. O'Rourke, did three formal interviews before the document ever came out. I make one offhanded comment to Wall Street Journal and they use it as an excuse to pull the whole document. So it really was, again, just obviously politics and, and bad personal decisions. Joe Lascalzo's decision leaves scanning still in the wilderness and the stent completely dominant as the main means of treating heart disease. 
even though the unexpected deaths are still piling up. By the end of the year, well over three million. Met Margaret on the southeast side of Cleveland, Ohio, which pretty much borders the beginning of the suburbs. I was uh, 11 years old at that particular time. Margaret would have been 13. We actually came together when I came back from the Marine Corps. I decided to go back to the old neighborhood just to see who was hanging out. And the only person that was standing there when I got there was Margaret. She was standing in her front yard watering her mom's roses. And I walked up and said, hey. And the rest is history. And in 2006, uh, trusting in God, we were enrolled in Pacific Lutheran Theological Seminary in Berkeley, California. Oh boy, here comes the sign. <laughs> My name is Margaret Monroe, and I'm a second year student at Pacific Lutheran Theological Seminary. Her first weekend on call, uh, she preached for the hospital community and was on her way back to the supervisor's office. She had a massive coronary, and she died. And uh, truly, my whole life stopped at that moment. More women die of heart disease than men in the States every year since 1983. So it's a huge problem among women. Five times as many women die of heart attack as breast cancer. Yet very few women have any knowledge of that or any inkling of concern about heart disease compared to breast cancer. So when we talk about the mammogram of the heart, that's at least five times more important to women than the mammogram of the breast. But across the US, doctors prefer to intervene after an attack with a stent rather than prevent it with a scan. Despite the fact that the unexpected death toll is by now over three and a half million. Almost unnoticed, a huge medical trial has been underway for nearly a decade. Codename Courage, it's the first major test of the stent's effectiveness. 2,000 people are selected, all of them with at least one blocked artery. Half of them are given a stent and statins, the new heart wonder pill. The other half, just statins. 2007, the doctors report their findings. One of the most widely used medical procedures is being called into question tonight. Nearly a million Americans every year have stents implanted. It costs on average about $36,000, and tonight a blockbuster study questions whether it's worth it. The results of the Courage trial are a complete shock. Stents, which pry open clogged arteries, may not be as effective in preventing heart attacks and death as previously thought. Pills and exercise alone are every bit as effective as the stent. Actually, medical therapy fared surprisingly well. And in the past, I believe medical therapy has been regarded as an inferior treatment strategy. Medical therapy is all you need. Patients need to understand that the treatment is good cholesterol management, blood pressure management, diet, lifestyle, what I call the ABCs. Aspirin, blood pressure, cholesterol, diet, and exercise and you don't need the stent. It's, the S is way down the alphabet, um, and we're not gonna get there. Um, if they have chest pain at some point, we can put in a stent, but a stent neither improves their outcomes, does, doesn't reduce their heart attacks, nor does it out improve their, their mortality. Well, the family history has always been horrible. It goes back a few generations. I have the disease and it's extremely aggressive. My body cannot synthesize the good cholesterol you need or, or rid itself of the bad cholesterol. My first open heart surgery was at the age of 38 and my second one would have been about 51. Renee has a double bypass in 2007, which saves his life. 
Surgery is prompted by a scan which shows a 90% blockage in one artery. After two conventional tests, an EKG and a stress test, had said he was completely fit. I have a very low opinion of an EKG. I've had two EKGs that were absolutely told me I was fine when I wasn't, when I was, in fact, very near death. The sophistication now with CAT scans and getting the, the calcium scoring and these other things is just really critical. Five weeks after his surgery, Rene starts a crusade. He's a Texas senator. He drafts a bill that will force insurers to pay for the screening of all Texan men over 45 and all women over 55. It's really hard to rock the foundation of, of the insurance industry and even public opinion on a lot of things. Um, but I felt the only way was, was to mandate these tests. Mr. Speaker, members, can I get your attention, please, just for a second, everybody? He's also taking on America's number one heart doctor. Steve Nissen is just finishing his term as president of the American College of Cardiology. Yeah, well, there were some questionable characters uh, that were trying to promote this. And of course, you know, Texas, while it is part of the United States, seems to operate with somewhat different, you know, character than some parts of the country. And uh, uh, almost anything goes in Texas. Um, and I was certainly not in favor of that. Doctors came up to me and say, that this is, this is just a bill to help a couple of vendors out on this. I said, no, doc, let me tell you my story and why I believe in this. It saved my life. And if it saved mine, it can save others. Yeah, you call it shameless self-promotion. <laughs> yeah, I think I probably use the term like that. Uh, I've not been known to mince words when it comes to that sort of, uh, of, uh, of approach to medicine. Any tool that helps us detect it is worth it, particularly as inexpensive as this test is. All those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed nay. Ayes have it. House Bill 1290 is passed to engross. After two years of furious debate, victory. Rene Oliveira's bill passes in both Texas houses to the intense and enduring disbelief of its opponents. Having passionate true believers does not make a test worthwhile. And so I would say that the test has actually been a huge failure. Well, um, he's an idiot and, and he's probably still in dinosaur times in terms of his thinking. As long as he stays in Cleveland, that's good, because we don't need his opinions in Texas, because uh, I know what I did has saved a lot of lives, and, and, and I'm proud of that. By 2012, Texans, presidents, and astronauts are getting scanned. Despite the fact that most insurers still won't pay for it, more and more people are going for a scan. After sewing up a big business deal in the U.S., Irish entrepreneur David Bobbitt went to have a medical checkup. Part of it, a coronary artery scan. He had the shock of his life. My arteries were that of an 86-year-old. So here is a 51-year-old who exercises every day, is careful what they eat. My parents lived into the 80s. I'd done all of the things you were supposed to do to be healthy. The following day, I had to go in to do an angiogram where they found um, I had one totally blocked artery, I had another artery that was 70% blocked, and I had a huge level of disease right throughout my, 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 my system. The shock of it, the shock of suddenly going from one day feeling absolutely perfect with no reasons of any issue at all to a situation that 75 out of 100 people at your level of calcification is going to uh, either be dead or have a heart attack in the next 10 years. Today, he's going to be scanned again. Told he could die at any moment, he spent the last two years on the most punishing of fitness and food regimes. I've done everything I can do, and the score will be the score. My mathematical mind says it was 900. 1100 will be, will be OK. 1,200 will be reasonable, and an over 1,200 score will be very disappointing. Remember, leave your arms above your head for the entire test. Now taking a deep breath. 
Plenty of white there. There is. Mm. In your LED then. Mm. You know there's a huge level of plaque there, you know? Um, so you just wait to see what the result is, you know? That's all we can do. So, just to sort of compare, your total score is 1028 and previously 906. Now, there's a little bit of motion artifact, and so um, Dr. Kennedy thinks this is a little artificially increased. Um, when we look at the number of lesions, that's something else that you can look at if there's a little bit of motion. So in the past you had 28 and now you have 33, which really isn't very different. Yeah. And so this is good news. Yeah, I, 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 I'm very happy with that. I'm very happy yeah. with that because I've worked, I, you wouldn't want to believe how hard I've worked. Uh, I've really worked on everything. The disease has barely advanced. David's still in a very high risk group, but for now, there's real hope he can make it. The fact that, that I, I, I could be around like any father wants to be with his kids, the fact that I was, my, my daughters, that I, just so special that, that I, I would be there um, when they got married or when they, they were that bit older, that I'd see my grandchildren, that, that, that gave me hope. That really was what, really was was so important why I wanted to fight this as hard as I did. Without the shock of that first scan, David might not have changed his life around, might not have been here today for his family. But now the hope he has can be shared by millions. For all the problems of the way medicine is run in this country, the ultimate obstacle in the scan's path is that it lacks official approval. Then, in October 2012, after all the years of opposition, the American Heart Association finally relent and issue a statement saying that coronary artery scanning is beneficial. Breathe in, hold your breath. Yes, I feel vindicated. I'm just happy that uh, we were working on something that turned out to be valuable. Well, I mean, so, you know, there's this uh, old, um, saying that uh, truth passes through three stages. First, it is ridiculed, then it is violently opposed, finally it is accepted as being self-evident. The data really does speak for itself. And when the American Carter of Cardiology and the American Heart Association signs off on it and says it's reasonable to use it, then the remaining naysayers are just a voice wandering in the wilderness. We could have gotten there in a perfect world, we could have gotten there in three to five years. We'd all gotten behind it in the, in the beginning. Well, and say so what? Well, how many lives do you think would have been saved if we'd done it in 1990, um, what we're doing now in 2013? And the answer is? In the 30 years since coronary artery scanning was invented, over four million people have died without any warning. That's the equivalent of half the population of New York City dropping dead. And most of these people could have been saved.